think even the F sharp folks are starting to change their message on on that as well. You know, like try F sharp org, they're trying to push it on. Hey, you can create line of business applications with stuff, and there are there's a tool. Um, of, I don't know, a framework called Web Sharp, Web, Web Sharper, which you can create web applications using F Sharp. So we're really trying to show that, hey, you can build a full stack application using F Sharp. Anywho. Thanks. All right, so today we're going to talk about discriminating unions. And we call it a game changer because you can really model, model things a little bit differently in your programs using discriminating unions. And there is no construct in C Sharp like this. Um, similar, but not quite the same. So we're just going to jump right straight into the syntax here, right? So this is the general syntax. You get type, type word, then you give it a name, equals, and then you get case. So it's going to look a lot like an enumeration. But I'm going to be jumping back and forth into code. Let me jump here. Syntax. You guys see this okay? I'm going to bump it up a little. Yeah, not for me. All right, so, so kind of, so here, here's a simple one. So we got the type, the name of the uh, discriminating use in is shape, right? It has three cases, right? There's a square case, a rectangle case, and a circle case, right? Now you can create a value that's either a square, rectangle, or a circle. So here's kind of how you would use it, right? So here's defining a square. So let sq equal square 5. So that number is probably the length of that side, right? And then a rectangle, it's of the type float float, that's a tuple. So a tuple. I don't know how much this syntax I'm going to, I, I you need to catch you guys up on with F sharp. Are we okay? If you have questions, will you answer me or ask me? <clears throat> so a rectangle is a tuple of two floats. So that's a width and a height. You can see 5 and a 3. And a circle is a float, and that's, that'll be the radius, right? So six is the radius there. So these are instances or values of the discriminated union. And then you can, here's how you might use it. So we got a function called get area, where we pass in a shape. And then we use pattern matching with the value that's passed in. So we're going to match a shape with um, these three patterns. And the first pattern is we're going to check the square. And what happens when I'm going, to, I'm going to gloss over pattern matching for a second. So when we get square, the value of that we use to, to create our square, 5, we're just going to get decomposed into the side variable. And then we're going to use that in this lambda on the right. So we're going to take side times side. We're going to cast it to a float here because the type of this is a takes in a shape and returns a float. That's the type of that function. And we said square has an integer. So to match a rectangle, we're going to just take width times height, and for a circle, we're going to say pi times r squared, right? R times r. Okay, simple enough. Any questions? Any interesting thoughts that you're like, hey, what's that? I don't understand it from an F-sharp syntax perspective. Like maybe the dot after the number? Yes, So you, you used int as your, as your yep. data type for square. Was that for a reason or just to show that it doesn't have to be a float? Just to show that it doesn't have to be a float. So if I had square float and circle of float, you know, that looks like the same kind of thing. But I'm going to show that it can be anything, really. So I did int. And then in C sharp, so this is kind of like strongly typed, right? So F sharp is more strongly typed than C sharp. And the fact that here, it won't convert my integers to a float. C sharp will do that for you, right? F sharp won't. So I actually have to take the product of you know side times side and cast that as a float in order for it to fit the signature of the function, right? So I'm going to go through the questions that you guys didn't ask, and then. Uh, so what's implicit there is that the, the result of the pattern match has to be the same type, even though it may be different types. Right. Because into the patterns, they all have to, the type they return has to be the same. Right, because everything, if you remember, everything in F-sharp is a function and returns a value. So I could just as easy say, let x equal match. And so that expression, that whole match expression is going to return a single value, right? 
So, and it can't return different values, different types of values, I should say. And then this dot here, this is just shorthand um, because these are floats. And you do <laughs> dot and zero or whatever. Because if I say five, it looks like an int. And then the compiler complains and it says, hey, you can't create a rectangle with the int. It has to be a float. So I just do the dot. That's a shorthand. All right? So that's a simple case. And then I want to show right here. Let me show it in action, I guess. So we'll just do this through the interactive window. So go away. I have a really dumb question about <clears throat> why they chose the, um, the comments as being uh, parentheses star as opposed to the you know the slash slash you know that's in C and C sharp and Java and every other language I'm aware of. Yeah. I, I can't answer that question. Yeah, sharp people didn't choose that. That's <laughs> that's the convention used yeah. in standard ML. Is that ML? Which, which this you, language derives from. Can't you use uh, two slashes on a single line? You can. Yeah. You can. Oh, you can. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that's a that's block, that's a block, block comment. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. I mean, it's not terribly different from the, the C uh, bracket. Yeah. No. Four slashes. No, no. The, the, it's not friend star star. It's, it's for the which one? In C, but in C. Oh, in C? Yes. Is, isn't it just slash star? C, huh? yeah. oh, or slash star, followed by star. So so here I just ran the code here in the interactive window. So here's our function, and here are the values that we're creating. And then here it is calling the, the function, printing out the areas. So this, that was an example showing, showing a discriminating union where we actually put different types on the different cases. We don't have to have types on the cases, okay? So an example down here, you say type notification equals email, SMS, postal. So that is very much like an enumeration that you would think of in C Sharp, okay? So it doesn't have to have a type. And a nice and a kind of syntactically, you can also do it on a single line like that, which is kind of nice, a little more compact. Right. F-sharp people like their compactness, I think. Yes? Actually, back on the first example where you did have the, um, I think it was square and int, you know how it's actually doing the matching? Like, if you actually do have square and float, I mean, it's, it's cool, it's actually storing square or storing that it knows that it is a square, not a circle that you're passing in? It does. It's, it's a name, which is a tag. Like, like a tag plus mm -hmm. the, the data type then. So the data type is useful because the data type basically is um, defining a constructor. You can think of it that way, okay? So it's kind of like a square class with an int constructor, okay? That's not a bad way to think about it. And then when it does pattern matching, basically when you do that kind of pattern with a, with a discriminated union, it's doing what's called decomposing. So it's taking that shape value that's being passed in and it kind of, I think of pattern matching, you know those shape sorters, right, that little kids have, right? So, so you pick up a, one of them yellow shapes, and you just test it against all the different patterns, and then, boom, it falls through one, right? So that's, what, that's kind of what happens, is happening here. So it's taking the shape value, and it's saying, hey, is this thing a square? No. Is it a rectangle? Oh, it is. And by the way, I have two pieces of data for that. I'm going to assign them to W and H for you, the width and the height. So it's, it's, a, um, it's like a control construct and a let binding all in one pattern matching. So it's a real nice shorthand and it's very powerful as well. Any other questions? All right, so these are the basics, right? Let me go back here. Okay, so you do not need to know this to use discriminating unions, but I'm going to share it with you because when I, since I've been learning, I don't have a computer science background, okay? And I, as I've been learning F sharp, it kind of, you, you tend to dip your toe into some of these computer science things. And I don't know if it's just functional languages or maybe I'm seeking these things out, I don't know. But there are, when you have a, when you create a type in a programming language, all right, you can have types that are made up of other types, okay? These are called algebraic types. And there are two kinds of algebraic types. There are product types and some types. So a product type, you got to think in terms of what can the value of this type be. So imagine a class, right? So a class has a name, which is a string, and maybe an age, which is an integer, 
right? So the, the possible values for an instance of that type is the set of strings times the set of numbers for ages, right? Now, if I add a birth date, right? So now I'm going to add a third piece, a third kind of type to that class definition, birth date. What happens to the number of possible values that I can have for my type? It multiplies again, right? So that's why those are called product types, okay? Discriminated unions are called sum types, okay? So as we saw in our shape, we have square, rectangle, circle, okay? So a square was defined by an integer, right? So a square could be an instance of, you know, 32,007, whatever it is, right? It could be one of any of those things. Or a value of that discriminated union can be a rectangle, or it can be a circle, okay? So if we added another shape, say a hexagon or something, whatever the set of possible values for that hacked hexagon, you know, gets added to the set of possible values that that type could be, okay? So it's added, so it's a sum type. Does that make any sense at all to you guys? <laughs> so discriminated units are sum types. So you can, be, you can define all these different kinds of types, or, you know, that it could be, but it can only be one of them. So it's a discriminated union. So the possible values are the union of all the different cases, but you can only be one of them. So that's where it gets its name, discriminated union. Interesting? Yeah. Did I lose you all? All right, so discriminated unions, comparing it to O. So they're like an enumeration, right? We kind of see that, right? And that's a, not a bad way to think of it, especially if you're coming from, you know, as the object-oriented programming language. However, as we've seen, each case can be a different type. So there's data associated with that, right? The specific data associated with something in a discriminated union. It's not, near, it's not merely just a case, right? Or a control flow construct. There's a piece of data there. Also, you get type safety when used in pattern matching. <clears throat> so and we'll show what that means when we get into an example here. Um, and subclassing is not exactly the same. So remember when I mentioned you can think of the square of n as a constructor for a square class? It's like um, you can think of it that way. So you can take a discriminated union and you can model that as if it were a class hierarchy, right? However, subclassing isn't exactly the same. I got a link here because um, I don't exactly, like I said, I don't have a computer science background. I don't exactly have all this stuff. But the idea is when you subclass, what you're having, you're two kinds of um, inheritance, right? You can do implementation inheritance where you take the methods of your of your uh, superclass, right, and they become part of your your class, right? Or you can do interface, right, where you can vary the behavior, right? So you're, you're going to implement an interface so that you can be used in certain situations, like an ienumerable interface or something like that. Discriminated unions are a little bit different in that um, you, know, you, are, you have that piece of data already there or something. I got the link that explains it better, but it's not the same as subclassing. So, and it, yes. Oh, was, just a comment. Um, it seems like whenever I've referenced, um, you know, an F sharp discriminated union from C sharp or something, basically that you, you kind of see how they they model it. But or if you read the documentation, what they talk about is that you know the way .NET actually represents a discriminated union, like the way it looks to another .NET mm -hmm. language, is more like an it's an, like an abstract shape class with three subclasses, right? You'd have a circle which inherits from that, and then there's some form of a tag <coughs> identifying which of the three cases it is, and then, you know, obviously the subclasses have their, their fields for data, so. That, that would make sense, I think, yeah. Um, I try not to look at F-sharp constructs outside of F-sharp because yeah. <laughs> it kind of blows my mind. <laughs> but that's interesting. So. I got this link, you know, I'll share this document with you guys and you can go explore that and read it and probably explain it to me a little bit clearer. But I just want to note that it's not the same. It's not... Uh, I mean, it, to be fair, it's probably another way to look at it. It's transposable, if that's the right word, I mean, from one construct to C-sharp stuff, but it may be that it's more expressive 
or more condensed form of, of expressing the same thing in F sharp? Yeah, so we're going to look at an example right now. So, so I, th I think a, the discriminant union is more about the data than the functionality, right? So uh, when you think of subclasses, you're thinking functionality, right? Because you're implementing some, you're, you're inheriting some functionality from your superclass or you're going to implement an interface, which is functionality, right? But, but the discriminant units kind of turns that over on its head, right? It's more about the data. So you got this piece of data, and then with, through the pattern matching, so as the data is flowing through your program, you hit this time or this point in your application where it's time to make a decision based on that pattern, right? And so, okay, now, you know, now that I, I'm a square, so I'm going to go do the squarish thing. Or, okay, or well, maybe I'm a circle, I'm going to go do the circle thing, right? So... It's more about the data, and then you let the functions of the, your program kind of just work with that data versus creating functions and pulling in data or, or, or something like that, right? I don't know. So I, what this all boils down to, and this is a good segue, is, is polymorphism, right? I mean, programs aren't very useful unless you can have it do different things in different cases, right? <clears throat> and, and, well, and just to kind of close the loop on discriminating unions, is uh, they're great for working with... Um, heterogeneous data, right? So you have a whole bunch of heterogeneous data, but you're able to tag it in particular ways and, and call certain aspects of it out, and then you can run that through pattern matching. It's a pretty powerful thing. So we're going to go through um, the, you know, the open-close principle, and it's kind of what we're talking about. So what that is, that's an object-oriented principle um, where it says that your classes should be open for extension, closed for modification, right? And the thought there is, if you're going to modify existing code, there's a good chance you might break something, right? And if you're working an object-oriented language, chances are you probably have some subclassing or stuff going on. You could break all kinds of stuff, right? So remember what I said about in inheriting, how it's a little different, and how discriminating union, unions kind of turns it on its head, right? So instead of the functionality part, getting from the inheritance, we're going to work through the data side. So here's, I got an example here. Um, the visitor pattern is, um, so this is C-sharp. So I got this visitor, I just pulled this visitor example from um, Wikipedia, okay? So the visitor pattern is a way to kind of get the open-closed principle. So you can, you can kind of just extend your classes and get additional behavior from it. And what this model here is, um, is about cars, okay? So let me start, it might make sense if I start down here. 